a very common pattern of restricted spring mobility in the pelvis is a pattern that is named sacral torsion. In the traditional model, a sacral torsion is defined as a sacrum that, as an arbitrary example, bent forward, rotated left, and side bent left. And that motion happens on an oblique axis, okay? Um, there is research that shows that the sacrum can move that way, but only very small amount, less than two degrees rotation, less than two degrees of glide in each SI joint. Um, so it begs the question of can clinicians discern that? Um, what I have found is that a torsion will increase when the person is flexed. So if they're sitting, it might not be visible, but as they bend forward, that pattern manifests. Sometimes you'll still see that pattern in prone, but basically I make it very simple. We draw a line up and down the spine, down to the coccyx. We draw a horizontal through the PSISs, and that divides the sacrum into two upper and two lower quadrants. Um, people say, well, they're hard, it's hard to palpate accurately. So I'm like, wait a minute, wait. In sitting, the midline is the tailbone. If you can feel the tailbone come on both sides and an inch apart or, or two inches apart, come up one inch, you're on the lower quadrant of the sacrum. The most common pattern of a torsion happens in the lower quadrant. So what you do is you palpate on both sides and you have them bend forward. And a typical pattern would be the left lower quadrant sticks posteriorly. And then you can try and thrust it forward on the right. And you do the same thing on the left and you'll find it to be stuck, okay? Now within a torsion is a side bent it can side bend left or right, depending on the type of torsion. However, it's not necessary to identify the side bending because if one quadrant of the sacrum is stuck, you know that's a torsion. And when you restore that rotational component, the side bending corrects as well. So I have a much simpler model of nomenclature. Um, we could use traditional nomenclature and state that this patient has a left rotation on a left oblique axis. Confuses me every time I hear that kind of terminology. In contrast, the hash definition would be left lower sacral quadrant is prominent and stuck. That's all you need to know. Okay. That tells you what's stuck, where it's stuck, and implies what it needs to restore movement, okay? So these people come to me, uh, in, in, incredibly, like 60% of my clients come with this pattern. And they have had lots of chiropractic adjustments, lots of physical therapy, muscle energy, trying to align their pelvis, um, which is a very limited approach because it doesn't, evaluate micro movement in the pelvis. Um, and I correct it in about two minutes and it stays corrected. I also teach them a very simple self-treatment. So if that pattern were to come again, then they would, you know, capture it early and treat it successfully. They're not dependent on, on coming back to see me. And they feel like their bodies, they, they know that they sit crooked, they feel crooked, they're kind of focused on it because nothing that they do is, has helped that. Um, and it correlates with nociception and pain and reducing that peripheral nociception does reduce pain. Of course, pain is complex. We all know that. We, we all know that it's neurological, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's influenced by psychosocial uh, status situations, um, but when you can reduce the main input of nociception, you can make the person feel a lot better and also kinesthetic feel like they're back, that their body is normal once again, okay? Um, let me look through my notes and see where I am.
So I just want to reiterate that as an example, let's use the example of someone with a sacral torsion. There'll be one quadrant of the sacrum which is prominent and stuck, but the opposite quadrant will have increased motion. So is it helpful for us to say the right upper sacral quadrant was hypermobile? And the answer is no, because there's a direction in which motion is blocked and it's much easier as clinicians, it's much easier for us to restore movement where it is blocked than it is to constrain excessive movements. The good news is if you have a symptomatic direction of increased mobility, oftentimes the opposite movement is restricted. And when we restore mobility, the side that moved too much now is brought back towards the mean. It's now, it's now stable with normal mobility. Okay, um, lots of people believing their pelvises are, are hypermobile because they're being told that their pelvis is crooked when they stand and so they need treatment. I'll give you an example. I had a occupational therapist who was in tears because she was so focused on her pelvic asymmetry and she had been to 10 different therapists who had told her the same thing, 10 different professions. They all said, oh, well, your pelvis is crooked because your SI joint is out of place, yada, yada, and you need to do these corrections forever and ever and ever, right? Never worked. Well, my model of evaluation of the pelvis includes acknowledging that 30% of people have asymmetrical development of their pelvis. And they may be un unaware of their asymmetry until a therapist points that out to them and it becomes nocebic. And then they focus on, oh, my pelvis is off, my pelvis is off. It has nothing to do with the sacroiliac joint. If your pelvis is uneven and standing, we cannot know if that's caused by the SI joint and I submit that most of the time it is not. It's a false belief system. Doesn't it stand to reason that the body is gonna seek the most efficient pathway of movement? If I'm standing and you're palpating my PSISs, first of all, the intertestor reliability of, of, of palpating those landmarks is, is not good. Okay, there are at least four different shapes of PSISs in the Chinese population per a very recent study. Um, the joint moves so slightly in that context. So if you're standing and you have the person bend the knee and you're palpating the PSISs, the belief, the traditional belief is that, oh, the ilium is rotating on the sacrum. But does that make sense? And I, I submit it doesn't, okay? In upright posture, the sacroiliac is at its most stable configuration, okay? It's not a sloppy thing that moves all over the place. It's a remarkably stable joint and only in rare exceptions is it hypermobile or unstable. Okay, if you're palpating my PSISs and I lift up my right thigh, let's imagine I went perfectly to 90 degrees and then you have me do the same thing with my left thigh. Let's suppose that because of muscle imbalances or asymmetries that my left hip only flexes to 85 degrees. Is that an accurate test? I submit, no, it isn't. I could have two different hip joints, developmental asymmetry. I could have asymmetry in the knee joint, in the ankle, in the subtalar joint. You can lose most in the ankle and it doesn't necessarily cause pain. Same thing in the subtalar joint. And there are so many joints that move on the weight bearing side when I flex one hip. Um, the, any asymmetrical movement of the pelvis 
I will assume that that's happening on the weight-bearing femoral head. And I think that we need to uh, be more scientific about the test that we adopt. Um, Sturrison did a study on that very test and found that actual motion in the SI joint is less than a degree of rotation, less than a millimeter of glide. And we're palpating the PSIS, which is rather close to the joint. Um, and it needs to be questioned. Um, I find the spring tests give me much more reliable information about mobility than the traditional tests. Okay. Same thing with, there's a test where you lay on your back and you sit up and they say, oh, well, if one leg becomes longer, then that means the ilium rotated on the sacrum and got stuck. And that's a false belief. It hasn't been validated. And there are so many things that can influence the purported leg length. Tightness in my quadratus lumborum on one side would make me sit asymmetrically. That doesn't mean the sacroiliac joint has been implicated. So we need to be really careful. And unfortunately, um, now a diagnosis of sacroiliac joint dysfunction is a nocebic terminology because the patients go home, they jump on Google, they read all about sacroiliac joint dysfunction, okay? And the marketing, patient peer-to-peer -peer marketing is incredible. And people glom onto that diagnosis and they believe they're unstable. They believe they need very expensive injections. Uh, I think uh, first round of prolotherapy is about $5,000. And a lot of the marketing leads to fusion of the device. In 2009, there were only two devices for um, minimally invasive fusion of the SI joint. We now have more than 30 different devices. It's a tremendous cash cow. And the manufacturers fund the research and they conclude that fusion is better than, you know, uh, conservative treatment for this pain syndrome. So we need to be very careful with our language with our patients because that can be nocebic, okay? Let me see where I am in, um, in my notes. So when I treat my patients on day one, I do a whole body screen and I treat micro motion deficits, blocked motion in the body with a manual technique. There is an advantage to me doing that to the patient. Um, the alternative is that the patient may just say, well, he didn't do anything to me. He didn't put his hands on me. He didn't treat me. He just put a piece of foam under me. And sometimes put, just putting a piece of foam under you can be very intelligent very effective, uh, greatly improved function, reduce pain, et cetera, et cetera. But perception does matter to the patient. For that reason, I like to do a manual technique on day one, but I informed them right away. I said, now the motion is better. Can you feel that it's now better? Walk, sit, give me some feedback. So I want them to feel that benefit. And then I tell them, you can keep that motion and tomorrow I'm going to teach you how to keep it. So I don't like to, to give them homework on day one. I just want to see how they present when they come back after 24 hours. And it's extremely rare in which I will need to treat the same joint again. Usually it is corrected, okay? It's a different model of care. I'm going to give you an example of uh, reflex therapy. I was treating a woman and her husband looked like he was in pain. He was very stiff and red in the face and such. And I finished up early with her and I said, shall I take a look at your husband? She said, yeah, he's got a headache. I said, okay. So I looked at his body uh, head to toe and I found restricted mobility in his ankles and subtalar joints and his hip rotators were very, very tight, okay? His upper cervical musculature was like steel. 
And when muscle is incredibly tight, I know that that's a protective response and that it's being driven reflexively. Well, there are reflexes that connect your ankle, subtalar joint and hip with the upper cervical. And when you lose motion in those joints, you also lose motion in the upper cervical joints, particularly the atlantoaxial joint. So I treated this guy and I uh, restored mobility to his ankles, subtalar joint and hips. And then I went to his neck and the muscles were of normal tone, they released. So he then got up and walked, he sat down in the chair, he says, I always hurt when I sit. Um, and he had no headache. A week later, he sent me an email, he said, no headache. So I treated a cervicogenic headache without treating the neck. I treated ankles, subtalar joint and hips, and reflexively it released hypertonic suboccipital musculature. So we bl I blame the writing reflex. Um, in the example of a sacral torsion, the body compensates at about T3-4, including the ribs, and those will be hypomobile. But when you restore mobility translating through the sacrum, then that compensatory pattern goes away. Okay? All right. So in addition to um, discovering over 16 patterns of mobility impairment in the pelvis, um, I've also discovered patterns throughout, throughout the body. Uh, I have at least a minimum of four individuals who are certified in manual therapy in different disciplines, and yet they really like my approach and they state that it's more gentle and that it's more effective, okay? I have a large number of case studies on YouTube. So you can go to YouTube and just type in my last name, which is spelled H E S like Sam C H. And then whatever topic, low back pain, sacroiliac, pubic joint, hip joint, um, Atlas, whatever topic you want, TMJ, etc. You might find examples of, uh, nice case studies. And after 2015, I started to show the technique as well. If you want to learn my work, we have a certification program you can find on the homepage of our website. We also have a whole body course. On occasion, I get out and teach, but most of our product is, is being marketed online. And um, I think it's time for us to develop new approaches to evaluating and treating joints in the human body. A lot of our data is old. A lot of our theories are old theories. Um, there's also a lot of information on my website, which is heshinstitute.com. Anyway, this was, uh, the purpose of this was to do a general introduction to the Hesh model of treating the body and, and treating the uh, pelvic structure as well. I think we'll stop here. Thank you very much.